Hey, how's it going everyone? I'm Mike Pointer, and recently I've done a few videos explaining some of the Super Nintendo's graphical capabilities and how they worked. I thought it was about time I showed the Mega Drive some love, so here is a video dedicated to Sega's 16-bit Wonder Machine. Before I get started, I will apologise to my North American friends who know this console as the Genesis, but I'm Australian, I knew it as the Mega Drive, so that's what I'll mostly be calling it during this video. I'll also need to mention that I'll only be talking about the base system in this video. The 32X and the Mega CD are a whole other different kettle of fish which aren't in scope for this, but who knows, I might take a look at those in the future. Alright, so coming out a couple of years before the Super Nintendo, or the Super Famicom, you'd expect that the Mega Drive's capabilities weren't quite as advanced. However, it did have a faster CPU clock speed around 7.67 MHz, while the Super Nintendo CPU ran at about 3.58 MHz. You might look at those numbers and see that Sega's machine was more than twice as fast, so slam dunk to Sega, right? But due to the different architecture of the chips, Sega used a Motorola 68000 and Nintendo used a Ryko 5A22, and also other differences in the hardware, such as the graphics chips and the SNES having specialized components that took load off the CPU, it's not as straightforward as just comparing those raw numbers. Having said that, the Mega Drive did still run a little faster at the end of the day, and didn't suffer from slowdown issues anywhere near as often as the SNES did. It did also actually output to a slightly higher native resolution. Sega's console had a native resolution of 320x224, compared to the Super Nintendo's 256x224, so it was a bit bigger horizontally. That's without taking the SNES's high res modes into account, which as I explained in my previous video, were barely actually used. This often resulted in the SNES version of multi-platform games being cropped on the sides, a fact that the guys over at Console Wars never failed to point out. Shoutouts to them by the way. However, what is interesting about the Mega Drive is that it had an optional lower resolution mode that could be used, which made it equal to the SNES at 256 by 224 why on earth would developers use that, you may ask? Well, primarily, it was used to save on memory or to increase performance. I've previously explained how the Super Nintendo had 8 different background modes that all provided variations of the amount of available background layers, the amount of available colours, and various special functions such as offset per tile or the famous affine transformations of Mode 7. The Mega Drive didn't have anything like that, it was basically a one-size-fits-all setup, so let's take a look at how it worked. The way the final image was constructed wasn't necessarily with layers per se, but with what were called planes, although it's a pretty similar concept. Sega's machine was configured to have two background planes, plane A and plane B, which were technically a foreground plane and a background plane respectively. These two planes could be scrolled as you would expect, but they could also be effectively split on specified scan lines, allowing the segments to be independently scrolled at different speeds and in different directions. I believe the TurboGrafx-16, or PC Engine, was actually the first console to support this technique, and Sega smartly implemented it as well. This could be used to make a more convincing parallax effect and create the illusion that there are more layers than there actually are, but if you look closely, you'll see that none of these background segments that are scrolling at different speeds actually overlap. There wasn't really a limit to how many times this could be done either. As you can see, this high score screen actually splits it more than 10 times and scrolls the horizontal strips in alternating directions to achieve that animation. The scrolling segments of the planes could be as small as 8 pixels high, or in other words, one tile high, or could even be individual scan lines. Effects like bending roads, like what you see here, were achieved by scrolling scan lines at varying speeds, with the ones at the top scrolling faster and further than the ones at the bottom. All the other scrolling going on for the surrounding environment in both of the background planes sells the illusion further. These background planes didn't just have the ability to scroll horizontally, but could also scroll vertically. Well that may seem like a silly thing to point out because, well duh, of course it could scroll vertically as well, plenty of games did that. It didn't just have the capability to scroll the whole plane. It could also vertically scroll the plane in smaller segments 16 pixels wide. While this had limited utility on its own, it was often combined with horizontal scrolling. Depending on what pixels you manipulated, it could even be used to tilt a plane. 
It couldn't do a full rotation because there was only so far you could tilt before the object would start becoming distorted, but cool looking tilts were nonetheless definitely possible. There was also an optional window plane, which when used was always on top of the foreground plane. In fact, technically, it was a subplane of the foreground plane. It was not transparent and couldn't be scrolled, so it was used to display graphics that needed to stay static on the screen, such as a HUD, GUI or text boxes. Lastly, there was the sprite plane, which of course was used for sprites and acted as you would expect. The system had the capability to display up to 80 sprites at once. So, you had four planes in total to work with on the Mega Drive. But there's a bit more to it than that, as each of these planes also had two priority settings, low and high, and tiles on these layers could be set to either priority. In a nutshell, what this meant is that a tile set to high priority would be displayed on top of a tile set to low priority. So if you wanted some part of the background or foreground to cover up a sprite, you would set that to high priority and set the sprite to low priority. By setting different parts of the planes high or low priority, you could further sell the illusion that there's way more than just two background layers. The exact priority order from the back to the front went like this. At the very back you had a solid background colour. This could have been set to any available colour, but was usually blue or black. This was set in stone and couldn't be changed. On top of that, you had low priority plane B, or the background plane. Next came low priority plane A, or the foreground plane. Then low priority sprite plane. Then you had high priority plane B, high priority plane A, and finally high priority sprite plane. This is all still pretty high level as I don't want this to get too technical, but as always I'll leave some links in the description for you to check out if you want to go down the rabbit hole. If you are interested in learning more of the technical details, I would especially recommend you check out the channel Coding Secrets, as he's an actual former developer of Mega Drive games and does deep dives into how various effects were achieved. While we're on the subject of planes and priorities, I'll expand a bit on something I just briefly touched on in my previous video about how the Super Nintendo pulled off transparency effects, in particular what I said about what the Mega Drive did in comparison. I mentioned that it couldn't achieve proper transparency effects and instead used techniques like dithering to fake them. So what exactly is dithering and why was using it for transparency considered a fake effect? Firstly, I'll just clarify that the Mega Drive wasn't the first console to do dithering, and it certainly wasn't the last. It wasn't a unique feature to the hardware at all. But it did use dithering quite extensively, and thanks to its two background planes and priority flags, used it to fake transparency. Now, dithering at a basic level is alternating different coloured pixels. Dithering was used to create all kinds of effects like colour gradients, and what developers did to create a transparency effect is to alternate pixels between a solid colour and a transparent colour. That is, basically an empty pixel, like you're looking through a window. It's the same kind of thing that happens if you use an eraser tool in an image editor. These alternating pixels are very noticeable on modern HD TVs, but older CRT TVs, which these consoles were actually designed to work on, tended to blur the signal and blend them together which makes it much more convincing. So you can see why it's considered a fake transparency, because it's not actually creating a transparent object that you can see through like the SNES was doing. It's creating a checkerboard pattern and relying on the video signal and the TV to do the rest, something that's lost when viewing on more modern technology. On that note, it's worth mentioning the colour palette of the machine. It had 512 total available colours, with 64 of those being able to be on screen at once, which were arranged in four palettes of 16 colours each, with three of its available on screen colours assigned to be transparent. This obviously isn't a high number, especially in comparison to the Super Nintendo that could display 256 colours on screen at once from 32,768 possibilities. Heck, even the older TurboGrafx-16 had the same number of total colours with 512, but could actually display almost all of them on screen at once. So this seems like it was a bit of a weak point for Sega, although that total of 512 could technically be increased to about 1500 by using shadow or highlight mode to darken or brighten colours respectively. This is why many multi-platform games on Sega's console look darker, more grainy, and not as sharp as the competition. 
Despite these limitations though, some developers managed to make some really eye-poppingly colourful games on the platform. I will quickly mention here that the 32X expansion raises this colour depth significantly. In fact, it brings it in line with the SNES, with 32,768 total colours, and includes being able to display 256 colours on screen at once, in addition to the base unit 64, to bring the total of on screen colours to 320. As I said though, I'm not covering the 32X in this video, but this is worth pointing out. On the subject of colour, the last thing I wanted to cover in this video is a trick the Mega Drive had up its sleeve that could be used to show more colours on the screen. The capability to implement raster effects. What's that you may be asking? What this basically means in the simplest terms is that developers could change what was in the video display processor's memory while it was in the middle of rendering a frame. One common application of this was to swap some or all of the colour palettes part way down the screen by specifying a scan line where this interrupt will occur. As Sega's console didn't have the ability to do actual transparency, this is how some water effects were achieved where objects under the water appear to be a different colour to objects above it. They are drawing the screen with one set of four colour palettes, interrupting the screen drawing mid-frame on a defined scan line, and swapping to another set of four colour palettes. Because this is done mid-frame and can be updated every frame, this horizontal interrupt can change every frame in order to follow vertical movement. This could be combined with some other trickery to create some really cool looking effects, as it's not just colour palettes that could be swapped. Another implementation of raster effects was to manipulate the vertical scrolling on each scan line on one of the background planes in such a way that it makes it look like it's being vertically stretched or squashed, effectively creating a form of vertical scaling. This often involved making the background look like a sprite, which is a trick the Super Nintendo often did as well, particularly when it came to scaling or rotating things with Mode 7. So the next time you see a graphical trick like this on the Mega Drive, you'll know it's raster effects on a background plane at work, and it was used more often than you might have realised. Alright, that's about all I wanted to cover in this video, so I'll leave it there. Hopefully that gives you a good overview of the graphical capabilities of the Mega Drive or Genesis and how it compared to the main competition at the time. As I mentioned, I'll leave some links in the description to some other sources to check out if you're interested in learning more about anything I've talked about. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video, it really helps a lot, and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with my content. Thanks for watching and see you next time! Handgun collected. Handgun collected. Handgun collected.